Welcome to Bread and Roses. Hi everyone, I'm Aram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bors Puya. In this week's program, we're going to be talking about the massive protests in Iran and why we need international solidarity, people to people solidarity. We don't want Trump involved in any way, shape, or form. Interview this week is with um, Jimmy Bangosh, the spokesperson for Council of Ex Muslim of Britain and uh, L- L- LGBT. Uh, rights activist. We'll also be speaking about an insane fatwa from Dara Lulum, again another one, and this is about how Shias and Sunnis shouldn't mix. Segregationist, that's what they are. Complete. And our slice of life is Iranian women for the first time in 40 years entering uh, football stadiums in Iran, breaking gender segregation in order to watch the World Cup football. Iran lost, but they played so well. Stay with us, don't go away. There have been huge strikes and protests in Iran. This is a continuation of the massive protests that we saw in December of last year. And of course, a lot of it is linked again to economic issues and political ones. And for example, there was a huge uh, national strike of truck drivers. uh, And again, uh, more recently, strikes and walkouts of the commercial district and shopkeepers and and so on and so and forth because sales. of the horrendous economic situation absolutely and uh, can i just say um, in the last six months the exchange rate in iran has plummeted uh, um, severely on daily basis people can't do any um, uh, any transactions it, it, it's hard to do because it's changing every day. Oh, every day. You go shopping the following day, you want to go and buy exactly the same product, is 10 20% more expensive, is hyperinflation, and uh, um, there's no control over the inflationary trend currently uh, in Iran. But, you know, I just wanted to mention you mentioned the truck uh, drivers uh, the couple of months ago, and this was the first national uh, um, strike that took place after. Uh, for a long time, in 1979, there was a national oil workers' strike uh, in Iran, which brought this uh, Shah's regime down. And this is the first time that actually be coordinated um, uh, strikes in Iran, and that's what is quite significant. On the back of this, we've had um, people who, uh, who've actually have come onto the streets because they can't do any uh, any commercial. Uh, deals. When we say commercial, normal sort of shopping. You can't. You you, you go shop. Uh, a, sh- a shopkeeper cannot sell you a fridge because they can't. It's part of the supply chain. They can't go and get exactly the mm-hmm. same one for the same price. You have to pay ten percent more. So, so was, that makes it impossible. There was this example you were talking about earlier, where uh, you know someone paid cash for a fridge, went back two days later to pick it up, and they said, we can't sell it to you anymore because the prices have changed so much. You've got to give another 10, 20% before we can release it to you. So that's just the situation. It's become impossible for people to buy basic goods as well and services. Yes, and it? that's actually led to a, quite a number of um, um, strikes. Um, we've, we've seen in the last um, year, um, unpaid wages, workers have been on, on the streets, many industries, uh, um, uh, the, the working class have not been paid um, and they can't keep up with the inflation so you'll see there's so many reports of um, strikes and sittings and protests add to that to the level of corruption that Islamists brought to Iran mm-hmm. they've actually give me let me give you an example they've sold a huge uh, amount of water supply to a neighboring I- Iraq that's a deal a huge amount and actually the cities like Abadan and Afos they don't they lack basic water supply and they have to drink from contaminated water and that le- has led to huge uh, protests uh, in a city. So these daily um, strikes and protests going on in Iran um, and, and we've, we've seen this uh, and in many cities and it's, you could see there is a change and this change actually is quite significant um, and it's going to uh, herald the whole new round of, as you said, Mary, a new round of protest, um, and we need to pay attention to this and bring it to everybody's attention because if anything that happens to Iran, 
will change the face of Middle East yeah. significantly. For and of future. course, you know, this is uh, uh, about economics, of course. You know, lots of people are on um, very low wages, below the poverty line, a huge percentage of unemployment. So you're adding all this to the sort of economic dead end of the regime. Plus, there's all these political grievances as well and living in a, you know, repressive state. And one, uh, you know... Um, one example of that is the way that the regime has responded to these legitimate protests of people. So you've got uh, Khamenei, for example, uh, the supreme spiritual leader, saying that this is the work of foreign agents, you know, the, this, the, these protests. Then you've got Rouhani, who's always labeled as a moderate, who's basically said that there's no problems in Iran and people are just uh, painting the reality bleak, whereas it's not the case. And then you've got someone who's the head of judiciary, for example, saying that anyone who's involved in uh, the uh, protests should be killed, should be executed. I mean, this is the regime's response. And it's interesting, and very uh, same time, uh, a few days ago, when Khamenei was saying this uh, protest is the uh, it has hand of the foreign uh, government and foreign agents behind it, and they go around and smash people's sort of uh, property. The very time, uh, the uh, past Iran and the military force and the Islamic police were going around and smashing uh, the doors and properties and you know means of transportation of poor people on the streets who've actually gone on a strike. The, the contrast and the reality, the contrast be, be, between what they say uh, and, and the reality of life of people in Iran is so huge that it just becomes ridiculous if, and it would be funny if it wasn't that painful and I think that's the thing the life of Iranian people on the, uh, uh, both economically and politically they are under a lot of pressure and this is these protests it seems to be a turning point and it could engulf the whole of Iran onto a national at a national coordinated uh, level and of course uh, you know these protests deserve uh, solidarity across the globe people to people solidarity not the type of solidarity that trump talks about that's not solidarity that's intervention and bringing more reaction into uh, the middle east and iran specifically yes uh, uh, secretary of the states of the united states uh, it is said the iranian regime is corrupt that's correct but what they do, they so actually, is the U.S. government yeah, actually. But what they do, but what they do, they actually go and support the most backward element. They they bring in the most reactionary element. This is what they've done in in Middle East for many many years. Now they are focusing on supporting a, a, a religious sect, which is um, a renter army like Mujahid and Khali Iran. Sorry, who actually, gagged. they they are just like as bad as Islamic regime of Iran. Or they they usually support the most right wing elements in the uh, in the ruling elite. To, if there's any changes, so they could control them. So we need to push back on the uh, intervention by the United States, and that's all yeah. inter in intervention. No regime and, change from above. And it's regime change from below, people from people. To people solidarity, and yeah. it's important to uh, make sure that this is a key point yeah. uh, and needs to be highlighted, and needs to stand aside, and allow people of Iran and inter with international solidarity from everywhere else to sort out the Islamic regime of Iran once and for all and change the face of Middle East for the better. Program. I wanted to ask why you think it's important for ex-Muslims and the Council of Ex-Muslims mm. to march in gay pride. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Well, I think, first of all, it's important to acknowledge that there are gay ex-Muslims as well. Uh, and Pride is about hosting a space for people who are LGBT and their allies. Um, so last year, when we decided to march, we had a number of meetings prior to the march itself. Uh, and it was a very much a, a well thought through and coordinated uh, march that we had. In those meetings, we had a conversation about um, the struggles of LGBT both Muslim and ex-Muslim in uh, Muslim majority countries or Muslim majority states. And particularly pertinent at that time uh, was the press coverage of um, Chechnyan LGBT people. So whether they were gay or um, whether, sorry, whether they were Muslim or ex-Muslim actually, the way that 
uh, Sharia and Islamic edicts were being used to persecute them. And in fact, we even had heinous statements by the leadership there stating that you know, gays would be wiped out by, uh, by the end of Ramadan or the start of Ramadan. Um, I'm paraphrasing, I can't actually remember the exact phraseology, but certainly something in the lines of, by Ramadan, uh, gays will be eradicated, there'll be no space for them. And we heard uh, stories of and reports of um, something that we haven't heard for a very long time, Mariam, gay people being rounded up into concentration camps. Um, and then there were further stories of uh, people being told that they're um, their, their gay child had been killed or they would go missing. So we were really clear that we wanted to march in solidarity for this. And we were mindful that sometimes the political message of Pride has been diluted by what seems like a, a very corporate message. Um, and Pride requires funding, so there has to be space for that um, funding to become a available and generated. But for us, it was so important to march in that march and bring this political message because actually CMB is a, uh, 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 an activist organization with a political message. And frankly, we didn't see enough of that at Gay Pride last year. Considering what is happening to our LGBT brothers and sisters in Chechnya and across the Muslim majority countries, we didn't see enough of that. And if nobody else is going to make those statements, we need to be the ones to do so and be unapologetic in our uh, conducting of that. Extremely relevant for us to have this protest given the fact that you have um, uh, you know, homosexuality being punished by the death penalty in 14 to 15 states. Mm, completely true. And I think sometimes what we're hit back with is, well, actually, um, when was the last time somebody was executed for homosexuality? Uh, and, and actually, you don't have to look that far back. Uh, in certain countries, you know, you can look in this decade and you'll find that uh, evidence for yourself. Um, however, sometimes we're hit with, well, what has that got to do with LGBT people in the UK? And that's not actually how activism works. So if we think about apartheid in South Africa, when we look at how international, um, there was an international garnering of support to remove apartheid, we live in a very globalist world and it's globalized and we're interconnected now in a way that we have never been. And it's important for us in Western liberal democracies where we have the ability to articulate a challenge to Islamic states that actually seek to uh, exterminate or kill LGBT people that we do so. We have a responsibility to do so. And it's not that we get complacent here with the rights that we have and forget about those who are suffering because they haven't had those rights. And it's not even far away, Mariam. Sometimes we think about far away places like Afghanistan or Pakistan. Even more locally, if we look at what's happened at Gay Pride in Turkey, the last two Gay Prides in Turkey have been cancelled. Uh, and when um, LGBT activists have tried to uh, have a Gay Pride despite the cancellation, they have been hosed down by water cannons by the state and shot with rubber bullets. And this is on, you know, Turkey is not far away. This is on our, one of our next door neighbors. So we need to be very, very loud and uh, very vociferous in our challenge towards these atrocities. They, they are atrocities. And also, of course, uh, quite a few of our members are refugees and asylum seekers from those countries mm. and they're fleeing those very laws. So it's very relevant even to a lot of people here. In the march, the CME march, there was some controversy around some of our placards, mm. uh, particularly around the East London Mosque saying that it incites murder and also placards such as Allah is gay or fuck Islam Islamic homophobia. Mm. Can you explain why we needed to have those placards? Certainly. So the fuck Islamic homophobia placard was one I designed myself. Uh, and uh, I'm quite pleased that it generated the dialogue that it did generate. So for those who may not have seen it, the uh, F-U-C-K Islam was in one color and then the ick homophobia was in a different color. So the, the sign had several readings. You could read it as uh, fuck Islam or fuck Islamic homophobia. So it was possible to read it in that way. Uh, and this was deliberately done. and. The reason I did so was because that statement really, really uh, garners the experience of LGBT people of Muslim heritage. So when I was a gay Muslim and, you know, all um, 
gay ex-Muslims are gay Muslims first by definition. So when I was a gay Muslim and I went to the mosque to try and find out how I could be halal as a gay person and still love a man and enter into a relationship and they said no actually the punishment for this is death and it's disgusting and it's unnatural and it's a curse upon your heart you just need to pray more and then I went to family members and they said oh you know this is disgusting we will pray for you to make you get better you can't live your life in this way and then I went to the Quran and I read about the story of Lut and then I went to the Hadith and I saw Hadith about throwing gays off the building at that time as a gay Muslim person I thought fuck Islam like I was so frustrated by my absolute condemnation it appeared at the time and this was before we had groups like Iman or uh, Hadaya who were representing a voice for LGBT Muslims so what I really wanted to capture with that sign was that actually whether you're a gay ex-Muslim or a gay Muslim there are moments where this is how you feel and you just want to scream fuck Islam fuck Islamic homophobia and it was important to articulate that message and the reason it was important to do that Mariam is because one pride is the one safe place gay people have in the UK or wherever to have a safety of numbers to articulate a frustration without a fear of violence and without a fear of violent repercussion because I cannot walk around my own community and articulate that or even talk to members of the Muslim community and say you know what sometimes I used to think fuck Islam I really did that is not going to be well received but amongst a march full of LGBT and their allies in a march that has a history of challenging religious homophobia I must be allowed to articulate the frustration I have with religion and of course, there's this, uh, you know, there is a lot of criticism of religion in gay pride. Uh, it just seems that there's a particular sensitivity around Islam. Mm. So also the Allah is gay banner, for example, yeah. or uh, with regards to the East London Mosque. Talk about those as well, why those were important. Yeah, so I think when you, uh, when you grow up as LGBT in Muslim countries or Muslim societies or even in diaspora communities that have, a, have an Islamic... Um, uh, overarching Islamic uh, structure to them, then the juxtapositioning of the word Allah with gay is only juxtaposed with things like hates. Allah hates gays, Allah condemns gays, Allah will punish gays, and then we have a whole catalog of punishments that gays will face uh, and also we even have a, 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 a multiple choice options of how to kill your gay, you know, hanging, stoning, whatever it is, you have these options. So what we wanted to do was juxtapose these words in a way that actually people of uh, Muslim heritage had not seen and allow them to feel the resonance of the emotions that they felt. And what we saw was actually when we held a placard quite simply saying Allah is gay. There's no derogatory statement in that we had vitriol come back from the Islamic community towards us and we even had some vitriol coming back from LGBT, mem LGBT members of non-diaspora communities. So we had some uh, people who were like white or black who have nothing to do with Islam and they said that we were being provocative and that we were um, offending people. But really the offense was caused by the fact that we put Allah is gay those two words, Allah and gay, next to each other. And what that speaks to is the venom and hatred towards LGBT in our community, rather than activists who are bringing attention to that. It's so important to illustrate and highlight for people that our march in gay pride is not gay ex-Muslims or ex-Muslims punching down at uh, Muslim people. It's very much about ex-Muslims and gay ex-Muslims punching up at religious homophobia and there's a clear distinction between those two. Yeah, definitely. And also, um, so what do you say to people who are saying, who are Muslims, who are saying that by ex-Muslims doing that it's making pride feel mm. unsafe for Muslims yeah. and that they don't feel comfortable, it's offensive to them and we shouldn't do things like that. Yeah, so I think we have to be clear on what this is. So the the struggle for LGBT rights is a human rights and civil rights struggle and there's no getting away from that. Uh, I know that when we live in the UK sometimes 
uh, if you're an LGBT person because of the rights we enjoy in this country and because the option you have actually if you're a gay person of Muslim heritage and you know that your community is homophobic you have this option of stepping out of your community into wider society which is far more accepting so we sometimes forget that this is a human rights and civil rights struggle it is an argument to uh, validate the humanity of LGBT people in Muslim majority countries because they're not seen as human and we need to get clear on that they're seen as subhuman animalistic barbaric perverted you know these are the words we use to describe them so we have to be really clear on what this struggle is it's a human rights struggle and when we get clear on that as the foundation of what this is understand that when that we had the idea that women would be allowed to vote that was seen as radical and offensive when we had abs abolitionists who said people should not be property black people should never be property this was seen as not a middle ground negotiation oh we can't speak to you guys you're the absolute radicalists maybe some black people should have some rights but we should still be able to own other black people so the people who said women should have absolute equality people who said that blacks should have absolute equality and should never be property they were seen as radicals in the same way we are having some people tarnish us who march for the rights of lgbt as we are radical we're too far out there we're offending people Sim what is more bizarre though is that the same people who say this have nothing to say about hadith that say gay people should be executed they have nothing to say about um the concept of the story of Lot being God condemning gay people for all eternity. They never seem to have, a, have, have the, the gumption or the ardor to take on board these challenging conversations. But when we step out into the limelight and we call for a cessation of killing LGBT people, and we say that actually we will challenge religion at every turn where it infringes on the human rights of LGBT people or apostates, somehow they find a voice and, and the will to engage to silence us. Is uh, what you're doing Islamophobic? Because that's another charge against you. Yeah. So, I mean, it's important for me to say I completely reject that word. It's a complete conflation of two different ideas. So there's uh, Islam, which is a set of ideas, and like all ideas, it should be crit criticized, like uh, capitalism, communism, uh, socialism, whatever it is, Islam, Hinduism, Christianity is a set of ideas. We are allowed to criticize it. We, we should welcome criticism of ideas so that those ideas develop. And actually, if we're savvy individuals, we should understand that by criticizing something, we will be able to improve it. Yeah, uh, and then there's people who are Muslims and actually demonizing Muslims is not okay. And I will never uh, demonize Muslims. And most ex-Muslims that I know have Muslim family, Muslim friends, live in Muslim communities, and they're not interested in demonizing Muslim. One, one of the things that we should get really clear about is that you do not care about Muslims more than we do. Like these are our families, these are our kin, these are our countries of origin. So we are doing this from a place of love and love and progress wanting. Yeah, we want to see our communities progress. So tarnishing us with this blanket term of Islamophobia, which just seems to, in this day and age, apply to absolutely anything that has any critic of uh, of Islam and Islamic practice, is a way to essentially silence us. So I reject that. I really do reject that. If Muslims are offended by what we do, I think it's a pernicious argument to say that those who are defending themselves from religious persecution are offending those of the religion. You have twisted something there and it's a pernicious argument. Um, finally, I suppose I'd like to ask you, uh, well, you know, you had to fight to go back to pride in mm. a sense. There was a lot of arguments. Pride took eight months to decide whether they would let the Council of Ex-Muslims back. Mm. Uh, we are going back. So uh, why was it important to go back? So I think there was two pieces, two answers, I guess. So there's why is it important to go back and also what happened with Pride. So I felt quite heartened by our meeting by Pride, actually. I felt like the representatives who came to meet us took on board some learning. 
And uh, I think sometimes there's an element of protectionism around Muslim communities in the UK because they are a minority. If they become dehumanized, we see violence increase against people who become dehumanized, which is why I think it's so important for ex-Muslims to stand up for uh, Muslim people as human beings uh, because, because we should stand for everybody being a human being. So I felt like Pride came and met with us, took on board some learning and understood that actually we are not anti-Muslim, we are anti-religious uh, homophobia and we will challenge that. And when we drew some parallels for them around actually, you know, there were Christian people marching with blasphemous or um, uh, signs and it was absolutely fine and actually the history of pride which challenges cultural and religious homophobia and political homophobia uh, at very institutional levels and uh, ideological levels once we extrapolated that for them and then we said well we're just doing the same thing with Islam there was some learning and understanding there and I'm very pleased that they took that on board uh, and I think they should be commended for that so why is it important for us to march this way? Yeah, it's so important for us to march this year because one, if we didn't march this year, it would say that people were right. Yeah, so actually that ex-Muslims are just a bunch of Islamophobes who hate Muslims, even though they live in their houses and help them every day. Um, so it would have given credence to that narrative. Secondly, this is an education piece. So. Our presence and apostasy is a, is, is, is a topic that people don't necessarily understand. And as we were talking before about the international context of civil rights, we need to educate people on what's happening to apostates and what's happening to LGBT of Muslim heritage. And all too frequently, if something is not put in front of us, in our busy lives, it's very easy to ignore or not be aware of it. And one of the other things to draw attention to is that actually, Sometimes organizations can march in gay pride and try to capitalize the LGBT movement for their own message. One of the things I'm very proud about CMB that we did was we made sure that whilst we were marching for apostate rights, we were really talking about LGBT in Muslim countries, whether they were gay or whether they were ex sorry, whether they were Muslim or whether they were ex-Muslim. And we kept that as our dominant narrative and we intend to do so. And I just, I suppose because this uh, is also broadcast in Iran, mm. I'd like to ask if you have something to say to Iranian LGBT who are faced yeah. with such difficult situations. So in my next life, I plan to come back as an Iranian woman. Like the work that Iranian women are doing at the moment around challenging this mandatory veiling. And I think for LGBT people in Iran, what we have learned across Western liberal democracies is that feminism is intrinsically linked with LGBT rights. The struggle to control women is the same struggle to mandate men into gender norms and stop them from stepping out of it. The struggle to keep women in their place has to, by definition, keep men in their place as well and keep them privileged. So. For LGBT people in Iran and across the Muslim world, the answer to our struggle is the secular education of Muslim women. Whatever you can do to support the emancipation and the uprising and the empowerment of women of Muslim heritage, LGBT people, in my opinion, should do so. Thank you for having me. Darululam Dioband in India has issued another fatwa. Not them again. Surprise, surprise. Not them again. <laughs> I know, didn't they have one five seconds ago? It was just, just the, this is the fatwa issuing machine. This is the core. Like, this is where they constantly issue fatwas and every single one of them you look at with the, hello, what is this? It's like A the rubbish one. dump of fatwas. They can't, they like, can't, they can't sort of, they overdo them all the time. I they mean, can't stop, like, they can't stop themselves. And of course, this is the same Diobandis that own, I don't know, about half the mosques in Britain and they own Sharia courts and, you know, they're just lovely, lovely and fellows. And they're funded by Saudi Arabia, incidentally. Let's not mention Let's that. Let's not so. mention that. And, and so David Shirafat was saying that Sunnis should not go to Shia weddings or iftar parties because the two shouldn't mix. Segregationists. Yes. That's what they are. Yes. And I mean, it's the same bloody religion, but they still can't mix. So you can imagine you, you what You can't they eat think. together. 
about us. You can't. You, 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 there's no question of marrying. It's question of actually attending. Just attending the parties, wedding. Parties, weddings. You're not supposed to do that sort of thing. It's, it's wrong. It's bad. And of course, there's been a lot of uproar over it because people are saying, well, I'm sorry, we've got Shia friends, we've got Sunni friends, we want to go to their weddings, this and that. So there's been such a lot of uproar that they've basically said, it wasn't a ban, it was just a suggestion. They're chickening out. Keep your suggestions to yourself. Nobody's interested. Let them, let them just, let's abandon. Let's, actually, that place should be banned. In my view, dear bands, dear bands should be banned. <laughs> I think they, you know, they should be banned from banning things. I, I, imagine, you know, but they're only giving suggestions. I see. Okay, suggestions. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, is that okay? Suggestions. No, of we don't want your suggestions either. <laughs> End the stupid fat <laughs> <laughs>
which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.